uh, again, good afternoon to friends and um, watch enthusiasts tuning in to a live stream. I don't know what is the proper name for this channel. I, I, today title is Watchmakers Live. And it's again me and Andrew talking about what is going on in the uh, world of watchmaking. Andrew, before we go any further, Wist check. What are you wearing today? Wist check. We have a IWC Portuguese Yacht Club. So this is their um, uh, yacht timer uh, with a flyback function, which is pretty cool. Well, actually, I'll show you that because that is quite cool to see. This is what I was working on if you were in tuning in on um, our last chat. Uh, this is what you would have seen. So we have the flyback. So you push the re oh god, you push the reset button while the chronograph is still running, and it'll fly back to zero and then start again immediately. Uh, and then also you have your obviously your stop and your starts. I like that watch because the dials are well sub dials are well balanced. Mm. And the top uh, sub dial is a minute and hour chronograph, uh, um, sweep hand in, in center. What's on the bottom? So just the bottom is just your running seconds. Running seconds, right? Um, and and flyback is a special version of a standard chronograph. You just said that uh, you can. What's the beauty of a flyback? What makes it special? So the good thing about the flyback, and it's um, specifically if you're uh, timing um, several things, where say the one lap starts immediately after the next. Um, so what you will do is uh, while the chronograph is running, so you've started it, it's ticking along. If you just press the reset button, which on a normal chronograph won't do anything, um, but if you press the reset button on a flyback, all the chronograph registers, so that's hours, minutes, and seconds, will immediately go back to zero and then start ticking as soon as you release the button. So if you press it quickly, they'll all just go back to zero and then start ticking again immediately. And the benefit of that is, let's say you're at the Formula One and you're um, trying to time uh, Ricardo's lap. If you have to start, stop, reset, and then start the timer again, you will obviously lose some amount of time, maybe a second or two. Um, but in these situations, that does matter. So uh, flyback chronograph is definitely uh, more suitable for those sorts of uh, timing applications. Right. Uh, and I bet you glad you managed to put that watch back together successfully. It was a it was a big yeah. job. You said last time this is the most complex chronograph that you're working on. Yeah, most definitely. Um, it's uh, yeah, there's a lot of photos that need to be taken, especially when you're doing something uh, for the first time. Um, unfortunately, you can't get a technical guide for this watch um, to do the assembly and disassembly as per IWC uh, instructions. Um, and that goes along with buying spare parts. You can't do that either. But um, yeah, there were definitely a lot of components here. I have a couple of photos, actually, if we want to show them. Show, um, show them to us, please. And while you're getting ready, someone asked last time, hey, you said you can't get spare parts. Mm. You haven't worked on this. Why would I? Why would anyone, why would anybody trust you with their watch when you're clearly not IWC uh, authorized technicians or watchmakers. Uh, why would anyone trust you? And uh, <laughs> that's funny because that watch is actually my own watch. Uh, it's a stock watch that we bought, uh, purchased for our own stock, and we didn't want to. Uh, we didn't want to. Uh, 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 we didn't want to uh, ship it. To a new buyer, it's yet to be listed, but we want to do overhaul before the watch goes, especially in the times like this, where, mm. where, um, you know, it could be it could be months before that watch could be overhauled by IWC. So I trusted you on my own watch, right? That's the answer to that question. That's correct. I think um, slightly more simply as well, uh, watchmaking skills are transferable watch to watch. Like you have your general sort of motor skills and how you treat the watch, making sure your screwdriver is perfectly sharpened so you don't damage screws, how you use tweezers and, and this sort of thing. And 
basically every single watch has the same components in it. So a fourth wheel is the same in a Seiko uh, as well as a Patek Calatrava. Like they kind of have the same components. Obviously, they're made to different qualities. Um, but for the most part, a watch is a watch. It's kind of like a mechanic will work on whatever car drives into his shop. Yeah, there are easy, some things. It's easy yeah. for you to say that after yeah. five years. <laughs> uh, hello to Port Macquarie. And uh, good to see you uh, uh, joining in. Uh, Paul, uh, we also have uh, uh, Nicholas from uh, Sri Lanka. Super rainy here. It's monsoon well. Oh, Thanks nice. for tuning in, Nicholas. And I uh, uh, hope you will find the content uh, good enough to stick around. We also have uh, Lowood, Queensland. Um, and there is someone from Melbourne, John. Hello, John. Um, yeah, people are tuning in. This is very exciting that we actually have, uh, you know, uh, 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 viewers tuning in. Uh, with, well, as I said, the whole purpose of this is to keep your uh, the, to keep your collecting uh, on fire and watch enthusiasm. And sometimes. It's not about, I always say this, it's not about how many watches you have and it's, it's all about doing your research, having fun and, and, you know, sometimes just watching a video like this might add something to you. We hope might add something to your appreciation of horology. Uh, is a Mark Harley from Wollongong. Hello, Mark. And there is a, a viewer from Sydney. Sheriff Wollondilly. Wollondilly, I hope I'm pronouncing this. This right. Um, so back to your back to the IWC. You have photos to share? Yes, we do. So um, here we go. I mean, we're not. We, we we're probably short on time. We're not going to go into too many details. But if you tell us mm. what was the most difficult and, and most challenging aspect of that overhaul, and also what is probably that's the first question. Second question: What is the difference between uh, uh, what is the difference between um, the uh, the uh, standard or classic chronograph and flyback chronograph? You told us externally, but internally, what is the difference between two mechanisms? Okay, so uh, here we have just obviously the watch. This is the Yacht Club, um, very dirty at the moment before the overhaul. Um, one thing I thought was interesting, this is just the back of the dial. Uh, whilst we're, um, you know, doing dials ourselves, you kind of tend to see other people's and, you know, have a look at what they look like. And the backs of dials generally aren't very nice because they don't really have to be. I mean, they are literally on the complete other side of the only thing that you see when you look at a watch. So they're generally not um, finished in any particular way. Um, you rarely see perlage or anything like that. So this one in particular for the IWC actually has um, the indices and the numbers and all the little um, lettering that's uh, on top of the dial uh, is pushed through with little pins, but they actually have glue on the back of it, which I hadn't seen before. Um, this yeah. might be a common thing, I'm not sure. Traditionally, the pins would be pushed in and then punch a little bit and the whole area surface would be... Yeah, um, that's it. So, I asked Josh why why uh, why are makers nowadays gluing uh, indices, and he said it's just easier, faster, and you have a very good control of uh, you know modern glues uh, amount of how you put because you know this is all done nowadays, uh, almost fully automated. So mm. there is a reason for it. It's not traditional, but hey, you know that's guys done. Okay, yeah. next. <laughs> Let's have a look. Uh, these are the uh, the automatic um, poles, they're called. Um, in some might notice that they're very similar to um, Seiko. Well, the first, uh, the Peloton automatic winding um, was designed by Mr. Peloton at IWC. And that's if you've ever seen um, where both poles are on the same time. So basically the rotor spins around, your automatic rotor, and that turns that wheel there, we can see on the right. And then 
both of those um, pairs of arms are set on an eccentric post. So as that wheel turns, the arms uh, shift and they rotate uh, another wheel which is connected to your mainspring. So Seiko has Seiko system has two arms and the Peloton has four arms. Well, the, the Peloton has uh, the original design has two on the same side. Um, this revision has one on each side for Seiko, but then Pelot uh, sorry IWC literally just doubled it, so there's two on each side. Mm. Maybe they thought it was more efficient. I'm not sure. Uh, here we can just see um, this is a very interesting winding system. I haven't seen this before. Um, on the left side here, you can see the uh, the crown wheel on the very, very left with the screw that has three slots in it. So that means it's a left threaded screw. Um, there's a little intermediate wheel there and then a massive ring uh, wheel leading over to the barrel. So generally, the barrel is actually next to the crown wheel, purely just so you don't have to put all that extra um, manufacturing R&D in between it and the mainspring. Um, but for this particular watch, because they obviously needed the well, they needed the chronograph, um, more of the chronograph components to be closer to where your pushes are, which is on the, the crown side. Uh, they didn't have any room for the barrel, so they had to come up with a, a solution there, which I thought was quite interesting. A Andrew, what is interesting, mm -hmm. probably someone who is a hobbyist, a horologist, or someone, an amateur watchmaker, or who, who works on, uh, who worked on uh, Seiko, for example, and even watchmakers who work on uh, variety of automatic watches and maybe some chronographs sometimes this is completely different construction wise mm. it's completely different than what you normally see it, you said it's not more difficult to work on it, it but it is it is completely different yes right the layout the uh, and so so this is what we we we, we call in-house developed chronograph where, where iwc went through trouble of designing from scratch they didn't just copy some old design or use some meta chronographs they start from scratch so you know yeah we have this, yeah and it's on those movements that you tend to find kind of weird architecture uh because otherwise you'll you're used to it you know most people just use value uh 7750 i should say um so here um what we can see what i'm sort of uh aiming us at there's a screw that's just sitting on top of the bridge there and then you have this sort of uh, lever arm it's kind of like a yoke and this arm basically connects your reset pusher to the blocking lever or sometimes it's called a break um, and what that does is it stops the chronograph wheel for the um, sweep seconds so when you push your flyback button, the reset button, what this arm does is it rotates with the push and then it lifts off the blocking lever, which is another lever that's here, and it goes under the bridge and stops the chronograph wheel. So that basically lifts it up so the wheel can be reset and then immediately start working again. Uh, and it does the same thing when you stop the chronograph. But the interesting part is where the lever is on this post you can see there's two sort of cuts or, or four slots in this post here so that screw actually has a tapered shoulder and that post that's sitting on is kind of like a collet so as you screw that screw down what it does is it splits apart that post which puts pressure on the the uh, inner diameter of that hole there on the lever and then it locks the lever in place and that's how you adjust it you loosen the screw a little bit you turn the lever so it's maybe a little bit more to the left or the right and then you screw it down tight and that will keep it in that position so i thought that was very interesting i've never seen that before in in a watch so that's quite cool uh, what do we have here here we have just a... and neither neither have i and and hmm. these these little gems are what makes uh horology and, and watchmaking instinct because uh, there are different solutions to the same problem. You know, uh, split se uh, second chronographs and flyback chronographs have been around for uh, at least 100 years. And it seems that there is a one group of makers who basically just copy, and there are others who were originals, who, who were genuine inventors 
and they, they, they try to improve the work of the mechanism and introduce their own unique solutions. And IWC is, is a very uh, a very good example of uh, an affordable watch. You, know, you don't have to spend tens of thousands of dollars. This is this is a sub ten thousand dollars watch on the second hand market, and you're getting a very decent in house movement loaded with genuine solutions. You know, so we tend to compare this. This is this is why we how we compare that to something else. Like what's inside? Anyway, I'm not trying to sell it right now. So, um, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Andrew. You have hmm. some, uh, you have some more to share. Just I might just show one more. This is just the um, photo of all the parts once the watch is uh, fully disassembled. This is uh, all the parts on the table. So there's definitely a lot of parts here, and um, there's a a varying amount of quality as well i will say so i don't know if you can see my cursor but what we can see on this side this is the barrel obviously this the main spring isn't inside the barrel but if you can see that color that's on the inside that's just the bare machining finish um so that's not uh, you know post finished in any way that's basically straight off the machine and to achieve that color you need a, a very very sharp tool um to to cut the inside sometimes even a diamond tool and what we can see, the same on the right side, the hour wheel here, you can just see that green that's kind of reflecting off the wheel. I don't know if you can see that on your computers, but um, the wheels are you know, amazingly finished. Like this here is the fourth wheel. I don't know if you can see this little bit above the um, hour wheel on the right, top right-hand side. Um, fantastic finish. We can see some perlage, only uh, partial perlage. So if you have a look at the main plate down the bottom left, there's some perlage underneath the where the wheels would go. We'll, um, talk, we'll talk about perlage in a second. Mm, but, yeah. Uh, I promise our newsletter subscribers, or no, I teased them a little bit with a statement saying that, well, question, posing question, why does it take three to six weeks or eight weeks or longer or months in some cases or six months uh, to have a watch serviced when in reality, we follow you on this one. You started on Thursday. Mm. Uh, on Friday, you start. Thursday was disassembly. Friday was reassembly. Uh, today, you put the dial in hands, I believe, and refurbished the case. Yep. And then, uh, so three days for for you know to complete the overhaul that watch plus other tasks. You know, this was not the only thing you're working on. We have those uh, live streams and everything. Mm. So that was that was not too bad. I mean, standard Velger seven seven fifty can be overhauled in in less than four hours, yeah, uh, properly. So the question is, why does it take? You know, you send your watch to Omega, you send the watch to us, and we we'll say, yeah, it'll be all done in three, four, six weeks time. Why that? Why does it take so long? Why do you have to wait that long, when in reality, it, all those repairs could be done much faster? What is the main problem? Well, it's a very interesting question, I think, when you consider the answer both for us and for a company like Omega, because I have a feeling there would be very, very different reasons for it to take that long. For us, in our, in our uh, circumstances, um, we receive a watch in. It goes through a very small period of testing just to kind of work out what the issue is. Now, aside from major problems, which are very obvious, uh, so your broken mainspring, possibly a broken stem, or you know someone says they've dropped the watch and they've got a smashed crystal. Um, these things are obvious. That part can be ordered without touching the watch, without pulling it apart, because we already know the the caliber and the reference uh, for the case. If we need to order a crystal, so those things are very easy to get. Or sorry, I should say those things are very easy to order. Um, then the disassembly occurs we look for more problems um, but some parts you can only really tell need replacement once they've been cleaned um, especially after a couple of years the parts get very very dirty and the lubricant kind of hides score marks or wear patterns so um, sometimes the watch has to be completely cleaned now once that happens 
fingers crossed you've already made your order for the obvious things fingers crossed you haven't broken or lost anything um from start to finish of disassembly now we're cleaning maybe you have to make another order um once we start reassembling if you can without those parts in yet say for example a crystal i could reassemble the watch without the crystal because it's not necessary until the end um possibly something else might go wrong um, and that's another order that you may have to make so that's just the kind of process it takes as far as here is concerned and that still isn't very long but once that order goes through if it's a standard component say like a mainspring um that's just something we call up we go yep hey do you have one of these mainsprings and i should say by call up we have a, a parts supplier or a few people that have parts sort of left over from before the crisis um they might have a mainspring you go yep fantastic we'll pick that up at some point or have it shipped it comes back possibly there's an incorrect part it does happen um often um and then that's just for your sort of standard you know spare tire type parts if there's something really really specific say for example something for this iwc um not many people if anyone as far as i know will just have parts for this caliber lying around uh because not many people do this caliber or, or any iwc for that matter so then it becomes a, a situation of you call your parts guy he goes mm, i don't have anything maybe i know someone who does i'll um i'll give him a call and i'll let you know and the chain just sort of gets longer and longer and you end up with more than one middleman uh, looking for a part for you um and there are times where for a very specific part especially if it's vintage um it can take months uh, one example i can give is the we were working on a vintage zenith which basically had so much wear on a post that was pressed in uh, sorry on a post that was machined into the um, barrel bridge uh, that we needed to replace the barrel bridge and you know this has an engraving on it so you need to get the correct one you need to have the the correct caliber so we were going from part supplier to part supplier at least in australia for i think maybe two months just and that's just time of you know sending an email email comes back a couple of days later uh to i think six months later we were shipped one from italy i'm fairly certain we bought one from someone in italy um and that took ages that watch quite literally just needed that one part needed to be opened up old part taken out new part put in it was quite literally you know half an hour job at best that took approximately six months um so it can get very difficult sometimes and that's why sometimes your repair takes a long time now in regards to omega they have no excuse every work uh, sorry every watch they work on is an omega they have access to every single spare part that's ever been made for that caliber so it doesn't really make sense why they would take that long um yeah i mean well, i guess yeah we don't know really but they're talking to their service um people and watchmakers who work with big brands they are humans too they also lose parts and break parts and make uh uh, you know, order wrong parts, and uh, we don't want to be cynical and say, "Hey, this is a big conspiracy theory there behind the yeah. big brands, and all the watches are sent to China, and they all repair there for you know at, at, at ten dollars a piece or something like ridiculous." Yeah. I, mean, I don't know what's going on, but uh, I would say that uh, uh, problem in general is that repair means often solving a problem of wear and tear and mm. wear and tear on parts which are so small it's not always easy to spot to identify it's not easy to see that the part is worn out often and there are a number of parts where you can only determine that the part is not as good as it should be once the watch is fully assembled so you reassemble a watch you relubricate everything and you readjust everything and you see well it's not performing then you know roughly where to look further which parts would need replacement uh but that's not obvious during this assembly and this is why sometimes watches reassemble disassembled twice three times four times mm. 
worst case scenario. And so it's not easy. It's not it's not that watchmakers are lazy. Uh, they want you to intentionally wait for parts. It's just the nature of the industry, I, I guess. Um, there's a question, best independent brand. Let me think about it. I will get back to that one uh, a little bit later. Okay, so uh, let's go to let's uh, let's go to uh, something else, and that is pelage. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, viewers can see this. I, yes, I believe. Yeah. So pelage. The other day I visited uh, a bank deposit. Uh, uh, box uh, unit building basement um and to my surprise this was a, a section that i haven't been before and i saw a number of boxes decorated with this uh, circular uh, finish these were our uh, aluminium cover plates and they were decorated with perlage and it looks like i'm inside i felt like i'm inside a watch because that decoration is is so familiar to watch enthusiasts and uh, um, and watchmakers and say, oh, wow, that is, that is cool. So you can see a close up to uh, to to uh, to the finish. And uh, I Google up a little bit. It says this is the Lindbergh Spirit of St. Louis was the pearl or pearlet finish sheet metal nose panels. Uh, you can see that what we call perlage um, on a nose sheet metals. So, Andrew, what, what is in watchmaking? What is a perlage? And and before before you take take us there, it is it is important to to highlight that perlage became popular as a decorative finish somewhere in early 1900s, and a lot of pocket watches, many many pocket watches from 1900s, 1910s, 20s, 30s are heavily decorated with perlage. So what is the purpose of perlage in, in watchmaking? Um, well, perlage, to put very, so, so, to, to really boil it down, is uh, a decorative element that was um, originally designed to hide machining marks. So basically to, to cover defect. Um, and uh, so perlage is, from French, which uh, I think can be translated to pearl patterns or pearl patterns. So each individual sort of spot is one pearl. And um, what we can see here is uh, the pearlage press. So basically it's kind of like a drill press, um, but the the lever that I'm holding onto there, you move that lever up and down and it pushes the, uh, the spinning bit up and down. Now um, that bit, is uh, basically um, grinding material. So you can get different um, compounds and it's held together with like a very weak sort of waxy glue. And it is a consumable. So you might go through one bit in say 10 main plates, for example. And um, what uh, to apply the perlage finish is you basically just pull down on that lever, the, the rotating bit comes down and it grinds a circular mark um, into the brass uh, main plate or the uh, steel component that you're applying the perlage to. So this would be done before plating if you're going to plate your uh, brass main plate because obviously if it was already gold plated you'd scratch all that gold off and you'd reveal the brass underneath. Um, and yes yeah, so that, that's that's basically perlage I suppose in in a couple of sentences. <laughs> Okay. Well, the, it also, it, it serves another purpose, and that is to hide uh, machining marks on a on a watch part. So, for example, you you are applying perlage on a, on a main plate of our watch, uh, which is machined, mm -hmm. uh, and then what well, we do particle blasting, so that removes a lot of. Uh, marks as well so in in essence we shouldn't we we don't have to apply perlage but applying perlage uh is is a kind of mark of quality and mm. yes it does take a bit of time uh skill wise it's not extremely difficult to to learn how to apply perlage i think i think like i say probably say in a week time you would be really good at it it takes mm. patience uh 
but it's not something that that is like crazy difficult to apply and no, yeah no. and after that the uh, part goes through through um, either rhodium plating or silver plating or, or gold plating this is a main plate of a high grade watch that where entire surface entire area of the watch of the of the main plate is covered with those um, circular little pearls and so it's i would call this a full pearlage and then on contrary you have a main plate that looks like this where only certain areas are covered with pearlage and we call this what do we call this andrew i don't know if there is a technical name for fake um, pearlage. <laughs> yeah it's it's kind of like cheap pearlage i suppose or like quick pillage so yeah so basically if you have the your barrel bridge um over the barrel which is the upper half of the movement um it will basically cover all of that non pillage section and then you have your train bridge on the sort of lower left side and that circular area uh, on the lower right side without any pillage is where your um, pallet bridge goes so all of those areas will be covered up by bridges and the gap between the two bridges, which is probably only four mil, maybe three mil uh, wide, that gap you'll be able to see down to the pearl arch. And that's why it's in a kind of seemingly random line. Um, but yeah, that, that very most likely would be done by machine. Yeah. Um, which bring us, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm, we're talking about this, but I'm bugged with this question. Best independent brand. Mm. Uh, that's very hard. It's almost impossible to answer this. The question is how much money you want to spend on an independent watchmaker. Um, and not, <laughs> yeah, it's. I'm actually keen uh, to hear your answer, to be honest. It, it is. Uh, watch independent watchmaking is very tough and and we have to have realistic expectations of what can be done for example let's say we're not talking now about us okay let's say uh, what 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 is uh, let's say i have five thousand dollars let's say suppose i have five thousand dollars and i want to buy an independent independent watchmaker um i don't think that would be enough to get into independent watchmaker maybe maybe ten thousand but mm. almost every independent watchmaker is different there is it, it seems to me that each one specialized in certain area of watch manufacturing design making mm. for example you know immediately uh, shapiro Right, Joshua Shapiro from California. He called himself an independent watchmaker. And I have interviewed Josh Shapiro, and, and if you have a second, you should you know find that video on YouTube. He's a young man, he's a very clever man, and is a is a is a is a good man. And his his specialty is uh Gilosh dials, right? So Shapiro spends all his time uh, uh, working on a, on a dials, right? He, he uh, decorates those dials with the guilloche pattern, and some of those patterns are his own. He also, uh, we help him, you know, in, in once he contacted us and said, uh, hey, you know, I need specific... Uh, tool for my guilloche machine. He used he used uh, an old hundred years old machine. He used old technique that he has himself perfected to a level that he's now confident to sell those dials. So so when you buy independent like Josh Shapiro, you're buying really a Shapiro dial, right? The mechanism itself comes still from Switzerland, mm. right? And there's no secret about it. He's open about it. Uh, so he buys, he buys movements. He put his own dial, which is fantastic, and then he he is independent watchmaker who's who specialized in certain areas. If you buy someone like F. P. Jean, 
F.P. Jean is independent watchmaker, but he's huge. He's big. He's got number of people working for him. He's got a factories make, making those those parts, and you know he started the whole business. But his involvement is is I don't really know what F.P. Jean nowadays do and work on. So to me, this would be this would be less of less of interest. Uh, there are there are people who are kind of. They're doing more than just dials or, or more than just movements. But, you know, I like Trikin. I, I would buy anything from Trikin. Uh, mm. I discovered recently Sukhanov. Sukhanov is a, a, a fresh, new, independent watchmaker. And you can see, you know, he, he makes those parts. I think on his uh, first watch, he said that 172 components were made by himself it's a complex movement and this is this is really you know credit to his skills i don't know i don't have answer which one would you would, would i buy you know that, that, that there's so much to choose from yeah i, I would have what to say best, best is definitely dependent on um sort of why are they the best if you go you know maybe best finished you could possibly go uh, Viani Halta or Vutalanen. Um, if you know you want something that's really weird and wacky, um, you could maybe go your MBNF or uh, maybe even Urenwork Dresden. I think they, uh, Shapiro actually uses them for for his movement. They they have some really really nice movements. Um, but yeah, it really just depends on what you consider to be the best, I suppose. Everyone's yeah, different. But, Everyone has their own flavor. There is more than just the best. Again, Josh and I talked about this last mm -hmm. night. And he said, we talk about how difficult it is to create an environment where there is no dust, you know, dust-free. Like Omega and Rolex, they have a luxury to work in a completely dust-free environment. For us, dust is, is a problem that, that will never be solved, especially here in assembly in the city, where mm -hmm. our, our windows are not dust-proof. So, so there's dust everywhere you know those particles are everywhere and then he and i i, I said this is it's hard for us and he said but what about dufour philip dufour is you know one of the best finishers in in the world and his workshop is literally just one room in a in a swiss cottage and he works on a window open you know to to a paddock and then there's that cow that literally walks to his window and there is a cat on his desk and he smoke like chimney. Like what kind of freaking environment is that? Like, you know, you got a smoking Dufour with his cow and cat in a, in a really, really shitty work. Yeah. But I would, you know, if I would, th that does not offend me or, I think that's exciting. I think that's cool. You know, if you can take it to 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 next level in that environment. So many of those watchmakers, independent watchmakers, are artists themselves, and you know they don't. I, th I think we take. I think some collectors take them too seriously, where even they themselves don't take themselves that seriously. Mm. Uh, the rest is just the marketing, I guess. I, I have to say, I kind of just thought of it while you were talking. Best independent, best independent brand, Seiko. Because they do all the things that everyone else does in their own way at some point throughout their history, so I would have to say Seiko is the best. Um, Andrew, this is side note. How is your regulator clock progress? Oh no, Mr. Echo, that's to me. But it's it's you know it was Andrew who who cut the first gears and yeah, where where are we with that? We started this. That project started because of Corona 1.0, right? Yeah, that's correct. There was a long yeah, that was a long time ago. We started that. Um, once we, if you're following our uh, Instagram, we made a couple of posts for it. You'll have to scroll back through to find them though. Once we kind of got the clock ticking, uh, we basically came out of that first wave of, uh, coronavirus hype, I suppose, and kind of got back to work and back to reality. And, um, since then we have very, very sparingly, uh, touched on that, uh, clock. It's still in Brookvale at the moment. Um, it needs a few more components, most definitely, in a case. But uh, yeah, it's ready to it's ready to uh, be restarted. But at the moment, it's not doing anything. As, as, as 
far as I remember, the next step would be to, to make a plate, wall plate, and mount and make a pendulum of some kind and mount the mm. pendulum on a wall and then attach mechanism to the pendulum to start test, test, testing escapement. Uh, we know it's going to work. There's no question mm. about it. And, and you know, it, it does uh, work on a dry run, so to speak. Mm. The mm. power maintenance works that, that we solved that problem. Uh, ball bearings was a kind of good choice. Yeah, there's a, there's a fair bit going on, but yeah, it's not a priority anymore. I'm, mm. I don't know. One day, yeah. we'll back to it. The question is: Is there a, is there a market for a clock like this? You know that we have, we have business operation. You know we have to be realistic. How much time can we allocate it to a, a to a, a clock that probably wouldn't sell? Um, uh, let's let's move on because we are really carried away a lot with all sorts of things. Um, this is a, you called me on Friday and said, hey, I need your help. What was this all about? Uh, yeah, it could have been a few things that was all, well, but this uh, was the uh, Breitling bracelet, if I remember correctly. Um, so it was a very, very simple task. Add some links to a bracelet um, before we ship it out. Um, and it turned out to, unfortunately be not quite as uh, simply um, said as done so I needed to someone had to go at that screw and yeah, I need to get the big comes in to um help me do that very very simple was, look at the look at the screw head okay so so wrong tool lots of force no understanding so someone in the past tried to remove this screw mm. and my goodness uh, I struggled to get it out, but I did manage to get it out, uh, and I'm very, very, very happy about that. You know, I, it's really a joyful. See, the problem with this one, in particular, is that the damaged uh, screw is in a link that is attached to the clasp. So, if it was any other removable link, it wouldn't be a problem. But you can't replace this link, so the screw has to come out. You have no choice. Otherwise, you will have to replace the whole, the whole uh, clasp, which is massively expensive. Mm. I, I haven't felt better about myself and my watchmaking skills in a long time. I can tell you that. Mm. So, all done. That that, that was a another solved mystery. Yeah, most definitely. Um, and jobs like this are, are, are you know. They, they seem like okay it's just uh let's just put a couple of links into bracelet and move on you think it's a it's a it's a literally 30 second job and turns out to be a half an hour job so let's talk about a little bit about what we're doing right now in a workshop uh, of nh3 project and we mentioned last time that we're thinking of uh uh doing our own dial and hands that's that's one option. The other option is to continue using other dial and hands that we already have. Mm. But um, yesterday, uh, well, last week, Josh man managed to make a first dial uh, of titanium, and uh, he did guillotine on it, and we shared that dial with the uh, with the newsletter subscribers. I unfortunately don't have that photo here uh and he said uh, yesterday hey let's let's uh, case the dial so we can see how the dial looks like inside mm -hmm. the case and uh, check the uh, uh, check all dimensions and also well make sure aesthetically it works with the with the case itself and uh, I said well we can't do that without hands and he said oh I got some hands that I made a year ago and uh but they're not polished so we went to brookwell and mm. yesterday we literally spend a couple hours polishing hands and this is how it's done so the hand itself is also made out of titanium and uh it's it's a it's a relatively simple pro simple process it's done by hand we can we can grind those hands by uh grinder automatically but you know yesterday was a hey let's get this done quickly so so we can uh, see how it works does it fit or not? Mm. So various grade of uh, sandpaper, and it's done by hand. 
and you can see you know uh, uh, that yellowish uh, finish is actually titanium uh, resurfacing uh, underneath the uh, EDM wire cutting finish uh, and this is a hand almost done the final it's not mirror finish the final final uh, uh, coat is uh, the final finish is uh, straight graining so it does have a uh, some some uh, coarseness to it so to speak and then um, after polishing hands it is clean so we spend time cleaning those hands to our hand and mini hand and then uh, uh, we were ready to install them to watch but just said hey let's let's anodize them as well and this is the beauty of uh, of titanium you can anodize titanium to almost any color you want what determines the color of an during anodization pro um, process is the voltage uh, that you anodize at so uh, for example if you set your voltage to exactly 23.1 volt the end result is a blue hand and it, it is kind of very hard to describe that blue Mm. Uh, and unfortunately again my other computer is not there uh, not I'm unable to load some files but this is how this is how the hands you know two hands that we made look like on a guillotine dial uh, on titanium dial in a titanium case and immediately immediately it became obvious that that those hands are too heavy and that the our mark our markers indices were too light mm. we didn't have a second hand so we used an old second hand so but that was that was that was kind of okay let, let's have a look what you know how this is going to is it going to to be good enough uh to pass you know uh our expectation and josh kept asking is this good enough what do you think is this good enough for you do you think it's good enough you know what, what do you think does it look good and i said look it does look good i mean the Gilios looks fantastic. I, I say the Gilios is ten out of ten. The rest is okay. Let let's let's take it from here to 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 next uh, iteration. Um, I think you have your opinion as well on it, Andrew. Yeah, uh, I mean, for for me personally, um, when we first saw the dial, we were all impressed with the execution, especially for really our first like full prototype. You know. We're thinking, well, I we just could not believe that we'd actually made a dial at least to that quality. And whilst it's not all the way there yet, for that to be the first go is very, very promising. Um, especially when you know dial manufacture is an entire another industry within watchmaking. Uh, generally, you don't make dials um, as as a sort of watch manufacturer. So what? Um, that, that was what uh, really kind of excited us um, in regards to the proportions. Um, and this, this all needs a bit uh, of tweaking, you know, the size of each numeral, how long the batons are. Um, that subdial hand you can see there is just from a Rebelde. That doesn't have a, one that we've made on it just yet. So it's, it's, it's still very much a prototype. So don't, don't hammer us sort of. Yeah, too much in the comments or anything, but still very much a prototype. But um, I think purely from the execution, especially of the um, Gilosh, is absolutely fantastic. And yeah, very excited for um, all the other sort of iterations of this dial that we'll see um, in the next couple of weeks, I guess. Um, well, we got thumbs up from Mark Carley for sure. Um, there is, uh, well, number one, okay, so what we achieved so far with this, it's possible, it's doable, right? If, mm -hmm. if we continue to work on it, we will have it. Uh, hands, today we have a new set of hands cut, just, just text me, and, and I don't have this on a, on, a, on, a, in, in a, on a screen now, but we have a new set of hands, they look different, uh, still straight hands, but more Art Deco style. Uh, it's possible, but what I think is 
we, what we learned so far is also there are other possibilities opening up for us. For example, if we can do titanium dial, we can do Timascus dial. Mm -hmm. And Timascus dial, I think we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of requests from people say, hey, why don't you make ti you know Timascus dial? So show that on a, on, a, on, a, on a watch, right? It's okay on the back side of the watch, but put all the, that those beautiful uh, 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 Timascus uh, patterns and, and colors on the front. And they say, oh, I'll buy that watch. Uh, we mm. could, we were not ready because uh, even even titanium is hard enough to work in and and do do uh, guillotage on on uh, on titanium. And and mm. I've done my research and I ask my subscribers, I ask you guys, hey, is there anyone out there who makes dial titanium guillotage dial? Right. So do let me know. This is a serious question. Do you know of any other? I'm not bragging about this, you know, because we 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 uh, we're just doing it because we we are uh, we're set up for for titanium, and we are set up for guillotage in titanium. But the question is, who else? Is there any other independent, big name, small name, anyone making guillotage uh, decorated titanium dials? Because you know, I would I would like to see those dials and see what what, what they what they've uh, what they've uh, how far they are in the in the in the in the development in, the, in development. Mm. The second thing that that is also opening up, and we just talk about it. And I'm here to share this with you guys. I don't have a problem with this. Uh, what if we can uh, put uh, titanium? Uh, Guillaume dial or even Timascus on Mark One. So we do something really, really um, crazy. Like it would be commercially possible, mm -hmm. and it would be uh, definitely attractive to have a, a smaller size watch like Mark One automatic with a with a maybe Timascus dial. So, so this is where we're heading right now. More of it, and. Uh, Hopefully we'll have some something to to show you guys and to impress you with. Mm. So, yeah, that that's the plan. I don't think we should stretch this presentation further than where we right now. We already went way past um, our our plan time. But if mm. you have any questions, if you want to make a comment, time is now. Uh, I think for the end uh, or before we go. Uh, before we wrap this up, uh, what was that quote? What was that quote uh, or from KPMG in the newsletter today? What did they say? That advertisement ah, I saw this morning going to work. It's uh, tom um, tomorrow doesn't happen overnight. Tomorrow does not happen overnight. It, how cool is that? You know, mm. just, just think of it. And I was walking to work and I saw that on my way to work and I was so encouraged with it and 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 I like to want to share this with all subscribers tomorrow does not happen overnight um, that to me this is this is you know in, certainly not in watchmaking mm -hmm. it will take years and uh, it will take years for 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 us to you know go to next level and next level beyond that but i think fun is in 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 a journey not necessarily just in destination um at michael how are we michael yeah good as you can see i'm kind of enjoying the luxury of uh working from home at the moment are you working or you're just having fun uh, are you barbecuing next oh. to Super Bowl? what are you doing a, a bit of both a bit of both I, I try and squeeze in some work every now and again <laughs> well, good to see you, Michael. Um, what do you have for us? Well, you know, we said last week that your your role working from home is to do two newsletters, camera newsletters, Monday and Thursday. How's that? Yeah. Is, this, is today's newsletter ready to go? Yeah, yeah, we'll be sending it out shortly. Um, and this one's quite an interesting one for watch lovers because um, the camera we're featuring actually was a collaboration. Um, so I'll just share on my screen. I'll get it up. Um, so uh, Nikon in the early 90s uh, wanted to make a luxury camera. Um, and 
Um, so this this was a luxury camera which was uh, made specifically for kind of a gentleman or someone who's traveling the world and wants the finest kind of camera they can get their hands on and in a compact format. Um, so they wanted to include quite a cool, unique design, which was an analog Sorry, Michael, display. Your, your Wi-Fi dropped out for a second. What, what is the camera model? Uh, it's the Nikon 35 Ti. So it should be pictured here now. And um, it was a it was a collaboration between actually Seiko and Nikon to uh, create a analog display system on top of the camera. Um, and that's what you can see now. That uh, dial and hands was actually manufactured by Seiko, uh, and they implemented that into this camera. So you can read more about that on the newsletter. Um, email through at mail at vintageclamera.com.au. Um, if you want to be added, we can add you there. And yeah, but that that's quite cool. Seiko collaborating with Nikon, another big Japanese brand. Right. And uh, we have one to sell, do we? Surely we do. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have we have uh, one with a full set kind of box and papers, uh, case and strap. Okay. Very good. Um, well, we're not going to, to uh, spoil... Uh, uh, your subscribers enjoyment so um, they will find photos and pictures of that camera and full description in uh oh i've got it here all right there you go hang on here it is T tell me what what it is what this is oh uh, so so this is a analog display for the camera's kind of functionality so you got uh aperture here uh it's the hands which will display analog uh, what the aperture is of the camera. You've got your focus distance here, so you know how far your subject is from the camera. You've got your exposure compensation and your exposure up here. Um, and yeah, that that's what was made by Seiko for Nikon. Wow, so so I, I've turned the camera on to check it out myself. Uh, yeah. The needle on the right went straight to 5.6 and yeah. uh, and the uh, the uh, distance meter was working in real time, so it's yeah, kind of yeah. To see those analog cans on a ca I have not seen anything like this ever. It's, it's, the, it's the only system. camera of its kind. My goodness. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we should just keep it, not not sell it at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, def definitely one to keep. Uh, yeah, but it's quite an interesting, quite an interesting story, quite an interesting camera, and yeah, that's that's the kind of stuff we put out on our newsletter every week now yeah I, I like this and very good well thank you for your contribution and uh i'm looking forward to you you know reading your newsletter for change and uh, yeah hopefully hopefully things will uh, go back to normal sooner rather than later and uh, you will be uh, uh you know allowed to join us at work <laughs> yeah yeah would be good yeah very good Andrew, you want to say uh, hello to Bobby or, or, or you want to say goodbye to him? Which one? No, I was going to say it's actually been nice without him here. There's more room. I've got more bench space. Things aren't as messy. <laughs> <laughs> <All right. laughs> um, okay, friends and viewers, well, once again, thank you for joining in. And it was uh, uh, our attempt to, again, share a bit of horology with you, what's going on behind the scene. And uh, uh, we're not trying to compete with, with any of other channels out there. We are really just doing our thing and uh, uh, we make ourselves available. If you have any questions, we're more than happy to attempt to answer them. And hopefully next time we'll have more sort of behind the scene and from the workshop uh, uh, news for you. Uh, one question that, that is going to be uh, to remain unanswered today is any recommendation on one hander watch preferably other than Meister Zinger? Let me do my research. Let oh, me do my research. I think I might know one. I think I might know one. I'm fairly certain it's called Komono, like kimono, but Komono. Um, and that's a Japanese brand with a single hand. That's, I think if that's correct, it's the only one I know of. So that's my recommendation. All right. Well, task for you, Andrew, to find us 
uh, I say three single hand watches makers for next uh, live stream and you will tell us more about them and you will tell us why would nick of time pick one of them fair How enough about that? hopefully my research will go better than the uh ladies seiko astron case size but that's another story and you're going to put a link somewhere up <laughs> all right wish check iwc of master none here bobby there you go <laughs> so real watchmakers don't wear watches all right friends once again thank you for tuning in you have a great uh, rest of the evening and uh, we'll see you some other time uh we do run a newsletter uh we send a newsletter every day and uh we have over eleven thousand eight hundred subscribers people who over for over 20 years follow what we do if you like to subscribe to our newsletter i think it will be a uh, beneficial for you and certainly we will uh, appreciate subscription to a newsletter we'll put link in a video uh for both vintage camera and watch secondhand watches newsletter that helps us stay in the business thanks a lot and see you next time